Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 15, let's read. Beginning in verse 4. Luke 15, verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep. My sheep. Now, I want you to remember that. It was his sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? She has found it. She calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me. I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and sent, that sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Oh, merciful Father, I thank you, God, for what you have deposited into my spirit this week. And so, Father, I ask you today, God, to anoint my lips. Lord, that I would not preach my ideas or my opinions, God, but I would preach the whole counsel of God. Father, I pray today that your word would go forth and it would pierce the hearer and the heart of the hearer, God, that we would leave this place changed. Oh, God, would you do something today, God? Would you stir our hearts today? Would you reveal Revive our spirits today, God. Lord, we are living in the last moments of time. It's time that we get busy and be about the Father's business. Help us today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You might be seated. Thanks again for coming today. Hallelujah. A few facts about church life today. If no one's being saved in the church today, the church is dying. If no one in the church is evangelizing, we don't have a future. If nobody's bringing sinners to Jesus, soon the church doors is going to close. That breaks my heart. It breaks the heart of God. We get so busy with life that the devil inflict situations, circumstances, problems, temptations, trials, and the devil has his puppets. We've all been affected by it. And what happens is, rather than focusing on the church, and seeing souls saved, and evangelizing, we become consumed with ourselves. Not necessarily in an arrogant or proudful way, but we begin to become consumed with what we think or what we want or our traditions and we've forgotten the mission and the mandate of the church that we are a part of. And that's lost souls. We've become distracted by things. This week it was the weather. We've become distracted by things in our own life. Sickness. Difficulties. Financial problems. It happens. In fact, many times we're overwhelmed by things that are not even in our control. I don't watch a lot of news because it just, it either makes me so angry or it breaks my heart. But I watched a little bit of the news this week because, you know, you're in the house, you can't really go to work. 
And I get consumed with things that I don't have any control over. And what's happened is we've missed the mark. I'm a nosy preacher. Since I've been here, I walk the hallways and pray. I do it during Sunday school and I, I listen in. And, and the devil's got us so sidetracked and heartbroken and overwhelmed and burdened and beat down. The devil's good at those things that I seldom ever hear cries and prayers of people calling out to God for Him to save me. I, I, I rarely ever hear the cries and the prayers in classrooms and prayer rooms of people crying out to God to raise up some youth leaders, to send teenagers and young people to our church for teachers, for our children, for laborers in this last day. The Bible, Jesus said in the Gospels, He said, don't pray for the harvest. Pray for laborers. Because the harvest is already ripe. And what the devil's done in our life, and the devil is so good, he's good on his job, he don't miss a day, he's not late, he's, he's always on the job, isn't he? But the devil has convinced the modern church today that if the problem doesn't affect you, if the problem doesn't affect me, I shouldn't be concerned about it. But you let a problem come to my house, you let a problem come to your house and you won't everybody know about it because you won't help. So what's the problem in the church today? The problem today is lack of souls being saved. That's the problem today. Lack of conversions, lack of people being delivered, changed, set free, healed, revived, and made new. That, that's a problem. And the greater problem is not many people concerned about it. Why? You know why so many people are not concerned about it? Because so many people think they're okay. That because they prayed a little prayer many years ago, that they're okay. That that prayer they prayed can never be lost. One of the greatest lies and deceptions and false doctrines that's ever come into the church is the false doctrine of eternal security. I don't believe that. It's not supported in Scripture. No. Mm -mm. It's not. Please, please stay with me today. Because maybe today you've wrestled with the, the doctrine of eternal security and you believe it not because you read it because a man told you and then maybe a mom or dad or a grandparent somebody you looked up to told you. Please stay with me today. Or maybe you're here today and you have somebody in your family that believes that way. We're going to look at some scripture today that will show us and them that there's some things you've got to do to hold on to your salvation. Amen. I hear this all the time. Well, preacher, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I, I just say to myself and God's a God of love, so... I just don't think that, that God would send me to hell. You ever heard those things? Yep. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be holy. You must be pure. You must live a sanctified life. You must come out from among them. You must be a part of the church. The body of Christ. Christ said, what do we do? Well, what we need to do today is we must look at ourselves. We must ask ourselves several questions. Today. I have to say, I have to look in the mirror and say, Stan, where do you stand with God? That's the same question you need to ask yourself today. Where do you stand with God? What have you and I, what have we done with the gospel, the good news, the, the redemption plan? What have we done with our salvation? There's nothing more important than salvation. Now, I like things. I do. I like things. I, we all do. I like cars. I like motorcycles and bikes and steel stuff. I, I like stuff. I like a beautiful landscape. I like to eat. 
Amen. Amen. I like things. But anything that I can touch, see, taste, or feel is going to pass away. There's nothing greater or more important than salvation. For Matthew 6, 26, Jesus is talking. What profit? In other words, what, what are you going to gain? What's the excess? What profit is it to a man if he gained the entire world and loses his soul? Then Jesus and the writers of the New Testament, the apostles of and others, they all wrote about this subject. They warned about, do not be deceived. About what? About salvation. How to get to heaven. About truth. See, the church world is quickly changing. I was so angry this week watching the news. And a lot of the news this week, if you paid attention, was about the church. See, the landscape of the church is changing today. The church is falling into apostasy. Mega church pastors who have influence over hundreds of thousands of people are telling their congregation today and last week they've been preaching that the Bible is no longer relevant. And their people are gobbling it up. More and more churches are embracing and accepting homosexuality. There's a denomination this week. It's one of the larger denominations in America. And they're right now having a general council. And it's looking like they're going to vote not only to accept it and to embrace it, but to ordain it behind the pulpit. Many churches are no longer preaching against singing. I may be concerned about my own, our own denomination. There's many churches today that are preaching there is no hell. Many churches today are doing away with the cross and the precious blood of Jesus. And Jesus warned in Mark 4, 24, He said to him, take heed what you hear. Church, we've got to be careful what we hear. Because a lot of times if we hear something that sounds good, we grab a hold on to it. And it may not be the truth. In Luke 21, 8, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not be deceived. In James 1, 6, Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. He's talking to the church. In Mark 13, 22, He said, False Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, even if possible, the elect. That's the church. And one of the greatest deceptions that have come into the church today and it's crept into the church of God, it's crept into the holiness movement, it's crept into the lives and homes and it is, is the idea that you can pray a prayer and be saved forever no matter what you do. It's not supported in Scripture. Amen. And this doctrine of eternal security has caused people to fall away. It's been used as a license to sin and it's causing people to be careless for the greatest gift. Well, preacher, if it's a gift, God's not an Indian giver. We've talked about this before. I can give you a gift, but if you're not willing to maintain the gift or pay the taxes on the gift, then you can lose the gift. You can get it back. Somebody can die and leave you a house. It's a gift. It was will to you. It's a gift. You've got to pay taxes on it. Maybe it needs a new roof. Maybe it needs some work. It might be in a bad neighborhood. And you say, you know what? I'm not willing to pay the price to keep it. I can hand you, I can't, but if I could hand you the keys, brother Keith, to a brand new 2015 Camaro ZL1, I'd give it to you. Guess what? you got to pay a gas guzzler tax. You've got to pay the property tax. you got to buy insurance and you'll need tires in a month. All that you can do by saying, you know what? It's not worth it. And you give the gift back. Then the false doctrine of you just do good. Just do the best you can. I'm doing the best I can, preacher. You know, our best isn't good enough. In fact, there's many books that ain't being written. Just give the best effort. My best effort's not good enough. I need somebody on the inside of me directing and ordering my footsteps. I need the Spirit of God inside of me to tell me to keep my mouth shut when I want to tell somebody off. Amen. Amen. Jesus addressed all these subjects in 20 short verses of chapter 15 of Luke. It's the text we read. 
Let's look at that today. Jesus begins talking about a man that had a hundred sheep. Remember what I asked you. Remember, they were already his sheep. Now remember, parables are Jesus relating to the kingdom of God how to get there. That's what parables are. A parable is where Jesus takes an everyday occurrence and relates it to heaven, how to get there and how to live. Remember, Jesus himself is the great shepherd. Jesus said that I am the door to the sheepfold. You can't enter by another way. So here's a man that Jesus is relating to heaven. It's a man, he says, he has a hundred sheep. All one hundred are part of his flock. They're part of his fold. All one hundred of the sheep that man has redeemed. He's took care of. He's washed. He's nurtured. He's looked after. But one of the sheep drifts away. Falls out of place. That one sheep decided, I'm not going to follow the shepherd anymore. The other 99 said, let's follow the shepherd. And so this one sheep that decides, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to go my own way, this one sheep finds himself now lost. He was once part of the flock. He was known and now he's apart from the flock. He's lost. He was found. Now he's lost. He was saved. Now he's lost. In Bible times, remember parables where Jesus took an everyday occurrence and related it to the kingdom of heaven? In Bible times, people that owned property dug pits. They dug great holes. And they dug those holes, and at the bottom of those holes, they, they put sharp stakes at the bottom of it. Because most shepherds did not have their own land. But they were allowed to graze throughout parts of the land. And so landowners would dig these great pits, put sharp stakes and sticks in them, maybe even cover them up, so that the sheep that wandered away from the flock would often fall into that pit and be injured by the daggers and the sharp edges of what was in the pit. They had a Jewish law that said after so many hours, I believe it's 24, that after 24 hours, if the shepherd hasn't come and rescued that sheep that drifted away, then it becomes the property of the owner of the land that dug the pit. Now in that pit, that lamb that wandered off is wounded. The pit's deep. And seldom can you hear the cries for help. Can I tell you that that's what the devil does? The devil digs pits out there. He has traps. Yeah. And he has things that stick us and hurt us and wound us. It's why we better stay in church. It's why we better yeah. stay in the Word. It's why we better keep following the great shepherd. Yes. Amen. So the shepherd of the story, Jesus said, this shepherd out of his great love for that one sheep, that rebellious sheep, that sheep that was once a part of the flock, the shepherd went on a search. And that shepherd knew he only had a few hours because it took a little while for him to probably acknowledge that one was missing. A shepherd counted their sheep every night as they came into the sheepfold. So almost a day has passed and that shepherd realizes, oh, one of the sheep is missing. So he made sure that 99 were secure and he went out on a search. He began to call. He began to look until he found that sheep. Now please understand, that little lamb would have never ended up in the pit. He would have never ended up wounded. We know he was wounded because the shepherd had to put him on his shoulders. He would have never been wounded. He would have never strayed. He would have never got off track. He would have never been apart, away from the flock, if he had obeyed the shepherd. If he had stayed alert, but he came distracted. And he wandered off. There are many folks today who were once a part of the flock. They were once a part of the body of Christ. They were once serving the Lord. But something happened that caught their attention. And they wandered off. They wandered away. Oh, they stayed, 
They may still come to church, but the gospel message no longer affects them. They become numb to preaching on sin and hell and get ready. They stop being a part. They stop reading the Bible. They stop praying. They allow hurt feelings. They, 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 those feelings cause them to start lingering behind, and now they're in a pit. They're lost. They're lost, church. They're not part of the flock. Right. And it happened because they drifted away. Can I tell you, you can lay down your salvation. Amen. You can abandon it. You can wander away from it. But I'm glad today that we have a great shepherd who will search and look and seek for that one that has been lost. He will convict. He will speak. He will call. He will woo. And it's up to you and I to take his hand. Yes. Yes. Amen. See, it's up to us that when the good shepherd, knowing that maybe we've backslidden or we've drifted away, I'm so glad that we have a great shepherd who will arrive in your situation. He will come to where you're at. You've been out of contact with God. You ain't talked to him or prayed with him. You're doing things you're not supposed to do. But I'm glad that because you were once part of the fold, that that great shepherd, he'll come and find you right where you are. And he'll reach out his hand. And he'll say, let me pull you out of the pit. Let me put you on my shoulders. Let me take you back to the place that you need to be. Yes, amen. It's called pulling you up out of the miry clay. But the decision's up to you. It's up to me. We can refuse the hand of God. And we can stay in the pit. Now remember, you're in the pit. You're bleeding. You're dying. And you're getting ready to become property of the enemy. And I'm glad that Jesus, to those who have drifted, to those who have wandered off, God is searching for Amen. And when he arrives, they have a choice. Then Jesus speaks about a woman that had ten coins. And she loses one. And the Bible says that basically she tore the house inside out. If you're mad, you've experienced this. Okay, if a man loses something, but if a woman loses something, the house is getting torn apart or a teenage daughter. Amen. Yeah, you let, you let a teenage daughter lose her phone. This woman had ten coins and she lost one. Now, I'll be getting asked, what's the big deal? If a coin's worth a dollar, she still got nine bucks. Why was it so important? Again, Jesus took an everyday approach and related to the kingdom of heaven. In Bible times, a Jewish woman wore a headpiece. And part of that headpiece woven into it was ten coins. Some are made of gold, some are bronze, some are silver, some are brass. They were all worth something. But every woman who was married wore a headpiece that had ten coins attached to it. They were called bridal coins. Now by Jesus' day, they had stopped stoning women. That was the great controversy when suddenly the Pharisees came and thrown the woman out and wanted to see if Jesus would stone them. They had already stopped. They stopped that before the end of the New Test Old Testament. Rather, what they would do is they would force that woman caught in adultery or caught breaking the law, they would force that woman to give up a one or two or three of the coins on her headpiece because they were valuable. Thus, when that woman would go back out in the public, if she had committed adultery or broke the law or disrespected her husband or whatever the law was that she broke, she would be missing some coins. You couldn't buy those coins. Those coins could not be replaced at the market. They were given to you as part of the heirloom, as part of the bridal price, the dowry. And so if a woman went out and was missing a coin, what would everybody think? Oh, you're an adulteress. You've done something you're supposed to do. You did something you weren't supposed to do. Oh, that woman disrespected her husband. She's done wrong. Why? Because she's missing one of the coins in her headpiece. So here's a woman who's married. And because of neglect, because of carelessness, other things became more important. 
She had forgotten to consider how valuable those ten coins were until she loses one. And if she doesn't find that coin that's missing from her head, her head right, then everyone will know she's done something she shouldn't have, even if she hadn't have done it. She will be proclaimed guilty even if she's innocent. They'll say that she's broken the law. And guess what? How will you convince her husband that she lost what was valuable? The husband will think you've committed adultery. You got charged today. They took one of your headpiece coins and he would put her away as the abortion and she would lose everything she had. This woman who had ten coins, she's married. She's lost one. She knows how now important it was. But out of neglect, she neglected the coins in the headpiece. And out of neglect, she's lost one and now she's in a panic. Hebrews 2.3 tells us, how shall we escape? What are we going to escape? This world? Escape sin? Escape temptation? How shall we escape? Are you probably going to escape it? I am. How shall we escape if we neglect? If we don't consider how valuable, if we don't take care of, if we don't look after our great salvation. Church, there's one thing that we need to not neglect. You can neglect taking care of a car, it'll break down. You can neglect taking care of the yard, it will look bad. You can neglect the house and it'll begin to fall in. You can neglect your children and you won't have a relationship with them. You can neglect the dog and it'll run away. But if you neglect your salvation, church, you're not headed up, you're headed down. Church, we must not neglect our great salvation that cost Jesus his life. We must hold on to the end. We must endure. Yes. Amen. 1 Timothy 6.12 says we got to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. That means grab a hold to. If you grab hold of something, you can let go of it. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. Hold on to what? Eternal life. Don't let go of it. But when we quit reading and we quit praying and we quit witnessing and we quit evangelizing and we quit following Jesus and we get lazy, when we neglect salvation, when we let other things take charge over salvation, we've neglected it. There's hope today if you're here and, and you've neglected your salvation. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus is talking. He says, ask. It'll be given. Seek. You shall find knock. It shall be opened. And then Jesus lastly, He tells us of a man who had two sons. Both are blood sons. Both sons are living in the Father's house. The Father's house. And one day the younger son says, I, I don't want to follow the rules anymore. I, don't, I want to do things my way, Father. I'm tired of having to listen to you. I want to be free to do my own thing. You know what that's called? It's called rebellion. He was once in the Father's house. He was once a part of the Father's house. He once sat at the Father's table. He was under the Father's protection, under the Father's provision. He was under the Father. The Father looked after him, but he, out of rebellion, said, I don't want to father. I don't want to follow you anymore. I want to do my own thing. And so he willfully abandoned the Father's house. Many today were once in the Father's house. Some have drifted away. Some out of neglect. But there's some that are not here today in church. There's some that are not in another church today because they have out of rebellion walked away. Because they didn't want to submit. They didn't want to surrender. They didn't want to do right. So they willfully walked away. They chose sin over holiness. They hung out with the wrong crowd. They listened to the wrong kind of music. They watched the wrong kind of things. And that started the process. But one thing I find about this occurrence with the two sons is different than the other two. This time the father didn't go out and get the son. 
In the 99 and 1, the, the shepherd goes and looks for the lost sheep and rescues that sheep. That sheep had to want to be rescued. The father went and found it. And then the lady that lost the coin, she, she searched. She, she tore the furniture inside out. She cleaned the house out until she found the coin. But in this situation, the father did not go look or search or go after the son. Why? Because the son, out of his own free will, chose to leave and do wrong. Deuteronomy 11 to 26. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. I set before you a choice. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God and the curse if you do not obey. In Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, well, serve somebody else. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But you know what the father did do every day? the father would walk to the end of his property. He would walk to the end of that dusty road and wait for his son. The Lord is only going to go so far. The Lord is only going to go so far for people who have willfully rebelled. But can I tell you that that father in heaven and the Son and the Spirit is waiting at the edge of the property. Amen. Waiting for those who have willfully walked away. He's waiting patiently, <clears throat> ready to take all those back who will step back foot on the Father's property yeah. and say, Lord, I've sinned. Lord, I've messed up. Lord, I want to repent. I want to come back to the Father's house. This young man came to his senses and he came back. He got up from the place he was at. So our question today is because we need to be about the Father's business. We need to be winning souls. We need to be evangelizing. But before we can do any of that, we must ask ourselves, what have we done with our salvation? music plays softly and you stand have we wandered have we drifted away have we drifted away have we lost the fire has something else found the place of our salvation has something else got our attention it happens maybe there's one or two here today and you've just simply neglected it you neglected your salvation you want to escape. I hope there's not, but there might be one or two today that will, you've willfully walked away. The Father's way today. Have you drifted today? Have you neglected today? Have you willfully walked away? There's good news today. The Father's here. He wants to revive. He wants to forgive. He wants to heal. He wants to restore. He wants to renew. He's calling all home today. Spirits to be a part of this family.